didn't Kasim G have a show called like Getting Deep and he would like or Going Deep and it was mostly like porn stars he would talk to? Uh, I don't know. You're the one who watched him the most and now he's a host on G4. <laughs> yeah, he's on Attack of the Show. I watched him interview uh, Robert Eggers of the Northman fame and it was funny because like, I don't know if like Robert Eggers is just one of those people that like just kind of doesn't like talking to people, but he looks so like annoyed. But I, by the end of the interview, he seemed pretty like, I'm okay. This is cool. So Ooh, I'm okay. He's like, I'm okay. I mean, he's, he's like uber metal head looking guy. Like, I feel like I'd see him at a metal concert. That's his, like his look, his aesthetic. Uh, hello everyone. <laughs> we, you <What> know, <laughs> We talk, we do, you knew we do this thing called we normally talk to do that little intro part we always do. And then I just throw us into it to the Raz cast. This is episode four. We're back. Um, a last podcast was about Oscar predictions, which I mean, not a lot really happened after the Oscars. The Oscars were pretty boring this year, you know, just <laughs> drilling that two month old joke <laughs> to the, you know, just putting it in it's okay it's been resolved dave Chappelle got hit now yeah i was gonna say dave Chappelle got tackled in response to that yeah that's in response to what happened at the oscars like two months later dave Chappelle got tackled what a time what a time take a look at that that's a callback to our brand new show that eric created for the channel so this podcast was something i kind of just threw at eric Clearly, he seems a little kind of on the fence with it, but I'm I'm actually low key excited because I I didn't. I'm I, also we were, very tired. <laughs> yeah, so is you're just you, you're probably gonna be punch drunk. You're just gonna everything's gonna come out because you're so tired. You're just gonna go on like, oh my god, I love this guy because like he really makes me just like love my life. And he's uh, and I'm gonna be like, Eric, we've been recording this for four hours. You need to shut up now. <laughs> it's all about Adam Sandler. Yeah, punch drunk love. <laughs> I'm Adam Sandler. Thanks for watching my movie. Um, I don't see, know if I like that impression. This is, this is how I win. See, I'm going to just do my uncut gems impersonation. I disagree. I disagree. <laughs> um, but yeah, I thought this would be a fun way to. Um, it, a lot of this came from our kind of downhillness a few months ago where like we just kind of weren't inspired and uh, luckily we kind of got back into a groove a lot of it was sort of you know not to be so melodramatic but not to be like super personal like Eric and I have been dealing with a lot lately and so it kind of was one of those like (laughs) yeah depression um (laughs) but um I know Eric when we started this channel I was really big on making sure he knew like every week I am not going to force us to do stuff that like we're not at least excited about like we may do stuff that's trendy but if we find it fun then it's one thing like if we're doing things just because it's trendy or topical or whatever we don't want to do that but like when we've talked about the game acquisitions and the oscar like we like that stuff so like we were excited yeah. um it's in our common interests <laughs> yeah it's in our common interest so we were like no we gotta talk about it. so i thought this would be a more fun like we kind of brought up a quick history in the first podcast. And then I feel like if you've seen anything of either of us, I feel like there's nuggets of stuff, you know? So I thought this would be a fun time to kind of just discuss who keeps us driven because of how things have been. And it was just sort of an interesting, it actually was interesting to me because even before we shot this or before the the intro to the intro of the video, <laughs> um, I was telling him how I kind of have a couple different groups of people that I consider because I'm inspired by a lot of people. And I'm also inspired by like, like if I have like favorite directors or if I have like a favorite, like comedian or something like that. So these aren't necessarily like who we think are like, who knows? Cause I don't know what his list is, but they're probably a mix of people. This doesn't mean they're like, it's not as easy as just saying who are your top like top five favorite directors or this or that. It's these are just people who inspire. So we may not even think like everything they do is the greatest thing ever, but it's like who are the people that genuinely just from the core of who they are push us 
creative. And I'll, I'll tell you this for sure. Cause I've been thinking over, I have three, so. Okay. I can stick with that. Um, but they're three <laughs> drastically, not like different, but like you wouldn't like put them all together and be like, here you go. They're going to hang out in a room together. That's good though. That's actually, that makes it more exciting. Cause that's the whole, you know, what you're, and it's funny. Cause I feel like, I don't know who you picked, but I can guess the areas that you pick them in. Like when you hear my people, you're going to be like, Oh, of course. Um, but like, I feel like yours, I can kind of see where yours I think are going to come from because then that's a great segue into your first one, which is. Gerard way. He was one that's on my list. That's a good one. That's a shared one. Not stealing the thunder. Yeah. Gerald, Gerald way. As I joke around. Ger- Gerald, Gerald way. Ger- Gerald. Gerald uh... <laughs> so tell me who is this Gerard Wait, it's funny that you said his name because I was thinking of comic book writer or artist, and I know he is, but like, you know, he's one of those. I mean, we'll we'll get into that. Yes. (laughs) Okay. Oh, so cool. (laughs) Um, but uh, my history with Chardway was when I was a young boy, and I will keep that pun forever. Um, (laughs) uh, you know. I was just still, it was, I was going into middle schoolish, you know, mm-hmm. I would say. Um, and my grandfather had passed away and it was like, rest in peace. You know, I, I mean, I knew him for a decent of my life. So it was still, but I was still like figuring things out. Yeah. And uh, my mom was like, Hey, I want you to listen to this song. Well, it was kind of like to the whole family, but she's like, here's this song. And it kind of just reminds me about everything that's going on. And she started playing Welcome to the Black Parade. And it kind of just changed my life forever from there with my aspect towards the pop punk emo genre of music and how it is written and how things have formed from that. Because I don't think I would have gotten my grand taste of music from not hearing that. And I mean, yes, there was more people to, you know, that whole album and everything that, you know, Gerard has done with MCR. Um, But there's a way that he writes lyrics, especially in a solo album. There's Mm -hmm. a way that he writes that's very interesting. Yeah. And it just tugs at you in a different way. And then going back to, you know, the comic book stuff, you know, writing Umbrella Academy. You know, you'd think this man is only good for writing music, but no, this man can actually write characters. I was going to say, that's the other plot. thing is when you brought him up and you're like, back when I was, you know, you made your pun. I was like, well, yeah, back when he was only known as the front man of this band that, let's be honest, back in the day, now it's cool to be a fan of MCR. Back in the day, like I was a closet and MCR fan. Like I remember being like, oh, well, no one thinks they're cool. So I can't. But now I go up, I go, fuck all those people. I hate the fact that I thought that way. Cause now it's cool. I was not a closeted fan of MCR. No, I no. You're the, the one that introduced me to them. So mm-hmm. I have you to thank for that. Yeah. The, the, I Again, they were a big deal. I've seen them. I've seen them. Live. I saw them live when Black Parade came around twice. And then uh, when Danger Days was, right before Danger Days came out, I saw them and Linkin Park. Yes, they performed, not together, but they were on tour together. That is true. But I was going to say, you're forgetting of the most important one, which is you and I saw My Chem before uh, Blink. That was the Honda Civic Mm -hmm. Tour. The Honda Civic Tour, 23. 2013 right or 20, it was a 2012 it was 2011 it was 2011 oh my god that's it was when, 2011 because that's when um that's when uh what's uh, the neighborhoods. name of neighborhoods and that's an album that i think people shit on too much and then we see you know, what I go after that and, album yeah yeah <laughs> i go back and i and i just listen to that album and that's album's great but we're not talking about tom and mark we're not which, talking know, about me which i mean yes Mark Hoppus is up there as well because he's just a crazy genius. I was going to say, it's all about the aliens with you. 
No, it's not. Absolutely <laughs> not. Um, he's not insane, but legally, I would diagnose <laughs> if I had the. Ch- <laughs> We shit on Tom so much, but we actually love Tom. I, I miss Tom. He's a great guy. He's such an asshole, but he's so funny. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, that concert was great. And, you know, we got to see fucking Gerard perform first date, for God's sakes. Oh, yeah, because Tom was sick. I forgot. He was yeah. sick. <laughs> A.K.A. maybe hungover or something. A.K.A. Lost he, was probably, he was screaming about aliens. Yep. Um, but I just think that there is that man, the fact that you could be able to carry a lot of these projects like that and be able to juggle it around like that. And I mean, yes, of course he's, you know, they had the break from MCR cause let's be real. It's a break now. <laughs> it was a break up, but it wasn't really a break up. It was more yeah. of a, we we're going to focus on our own things and, um, you know, he did his solo thing and he was mainly focused on working on Umbrella Academy his and Lucy's, producing that. His Lucy's were fucking like that baby or a haunted house song was really good. And then he did that phone it in song, which was only on like SoundCloud, I remember. But I'm like, mm-hmm. these are some bangers. I was so upset. I was like, because I remember he did an interview with um, what's the, the nerd guy that everyone, Kevin Smith. And he did an interview with him and he said Young Animal was supposed to be his next solo album after um hesitant alien and then obviously that became his whole line that he runs mm-hmm. um but i mean i guess we don't have to worry about a solo album now because your boy told you so <laughs> <laughs> they currently right now the day we're recording this they are currently playing their first show right now in the uk it's, what it's, is it's life? a miracle that that show was supposed to happen two years ago i mean i guess technically they had their comeback they had a couple, they had in a 2019 when they were in California. And then they were like, hey, we're coming back. We're actually they had an tour. album. They actually had an album ready. And then they're like, well, nobody's saying anything. So we'll just hold on to it until we go on tour. <laughs> I mean, they, re- they announced their tour and the tour sold out. And they could have just dropped whatever. But they decided to wait it out. Those mad lads. Yeah through all the um, COVID. It, it's so funny because um I've se- I've seen pictures uh, of people complaining about how an umbrella of academy was coming around and they're talking about uh Gerard Way, writer of the Academy, and they're like, how dare you say that about the savior <laughs> um, the savior. It's just the so of the damned. His 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 like dad vibes though are so funny. Like yeah, when I see him like, in interviews, because he, he put because he put on a bit of weight, which is fine. You know what? You can live your life think, however you because want. I think he takes like I think he takes meds now, and I think he's yeah. even been open about like how he takes a lot of meds. And I think, and this is just me being very stupid mental health expert. I'm pretty sure like there are a lot of meds for like anxiety and stuff that like kind of cause you to gain weight, but. And this is not even me being like fat phobic or anything, but like speaking of that, in these new photos he's taking with the band, he looks like he's getting in tour shape because he, yeah, looks, he looks a lot skinnier. He looks like he's like, I need to get ready to perform. Again. He's like, I guess he's like, I guess I gotta. <laughs> yeah, because he's just, you know, he's taking it what he can do. And of course, when things pick up, he's like, all right, we're going to do it. Because like, he's not going to be doing any press for this season of Umbrella Academy. Yes, he's like, I'm behind it and I'll, probably put out a song or two for the season but he's gonna run, he's gonna run behind stage and they're gonna be like oh get the zoom ready um thank you gerard he's like sweating uh thank you thank you so much um oh sound check in 10 minutes okay i got 10 minutes uh yeah what do you need to ask me come through quick now i'll, I'll say this though he uh, just the way he balances his writing styles for sure because you can tell that like in in music mode when he's when you know he's writing his songs he's like okay, clearly that this is the small plot that we have for the song and things like that whereas he can also flash out a full arc with characters and yeah and you know developing them and having you know inconveniences inconveniences you know plot details things like that mm-hmm. and building up like all that stuff and i don't 
I don't think Umbrella Academy is like amazing or anything. I really enjoy it, but it's just the fact that he's able to do this and you're able to have characters that are so vast and different from each other. Also that too, because there's seven distinctly different people for God's yeah. sakes. I remember after Spider-Verse came out, I was just doing some research and I was like, he, he wrote, he was a co-writer of Penny Parker. Like he's a co-creator of Penny Parker. Yep, I thought that was so funny. Co -creator. <laughs> yeah. He's done a couple different uh, Spider-Men. He hasn't written like the main line, but he's done yeah. a couple like of those, those individual. Cause he is Penny is yes. One of his. And then there's another dude that he wrote another version. I don't know if it's a Peter Parker or if it's, uh, if it's just a Spider-Man, because, you know, at this point, you can be Spider-Man without being named Peter Parker, yeah. which is cool, because that's all the point. I feel like comic books are kind of becoming, not becoming, it's like the new cool thing for celebrity, like, because I remember the singer of Yellow Card, like, he wrote a Venom arc at one point, and, like, it seems like, and then, like, CM Punk, I think, CM wrote Punk comics. Wrote a, so it's wrote like, a Drax, Drax run. Okay, yeah. so, like, there's, like, I feel like that's the cool thing to do now. It's like, hey, I'm a famous celebrity. I'm going to go write a comic book. Because I, I feel mean, like a lot of these people Keanu are like. Keanu did it. He did a Kickstarter and got his book. Yeah. Which I haven't, I've only read like the first issue. I haven't read the rest of the run. But I hear good things yeah. about it. I mean, yeah, because JJ did a Spider-Man thing. He did, yes. And that I was. I remember that. Honestly, wasn't really that good, to be honest. But, you know, that's why well, JJ's not in my I was going to say, are we surprised because no one likes JJ anymore? Isn't that the whole thing? <laughs> you know, I, hopefully these next few years he can take off and just refresh his brain. Because I'm sure Star Wars killed him. <laughs> yeah, that too. He had too much to deal with. Too much. But no, Gerard Way. That's a really good one. I think mm. I'm mad because I had one segue but I'll say what the segue was after when I get to that artist. But I think this gentleman right here is probably the best segue because Mr. Prowler, a.k.a. Childish Gambino, a.k.a. Donald Glover, um, is my first inspiration. I mean, I've always been a fan of him. And we were talking pre-pre-pre-intro. Uh, how I'm like, I had another person in mind. And then I ended up picking him because I was like, you know what? He's kind of similar, but like he's sort of moved into a different way. Like he started on the internet and then he went to 30 Rock and then everyone's like really stupid jokes of, oh, he did white people shit. He did community. But then, you know, he was Childish Gambino and then he made one of my favorite albums because the internet. And then that was around the time he was leaving community. And that was like his transition period of like, I'm going to fucking be everywhere and do everything. And he makes Atlanta now, which is like one of my favorite shows. It's so funny and so well-written. Um, he gave us Awaken My Love, which one of the songs on there became like an internet meme, Redbone, you know, stay woke. <laughs> um, I remember my dad was watching Get Out and he's like, That's, is that Childish Gambino? And I'm like, yep, <laughs> it sure is. Um, I mean, he's not perfect. He was in the Lion King remake, but it's okay. It's okay. You know, we all make mistakes, it, you know? Some, you just want some money sometimes, you know? Sometimes, you know, you're like, hey, I love the Lion King. I want to be the lead. And then things happen, but it's okay. Cause you know, you just have to bounce back. Um, No, I've always just been a big fan of him. Cause like you with Gerard, I just, I'm always so, is like kind of a jealousy thing, but also just inspired by people that, are so well respected in the different things and like it's just funny to me like the guy that was in community also has good stand-up specials which was the prime reason why miles morales was even created was when he said the whole joke about how he was being kickstarted. this was an andrew garfield spider-man happened and then he made probably one of the greatest jokes ever where he's like, someone said, well, if they're going to make Spider-Man black, well, then they're going to make Michael Sarah Shaft. And he goes, first <laughs> off, I would totally see that movie. <laughs> I totally see that movie. But no, like you, I, I love, he just has so many interesting things he wants to do. And I love his personality. It's just upsetting how he's kind of 
he's in that Guillermo del Toro camp of, I feel like there's a lot of stuff that he was trying to make that never happened. Like he was going to make a Deadpool show for FX and then it got canned. And then I Taylor Swift. Yeah. And then, (laughs) and then like, I feel like there was a couple other things. And then I always sit back thinking to myself, or am I ever going to get an album from him? But he did say he likes to do things in waves. Like he puts out a bunch for a year or two and then he just goes away so atlanta's on right now so i'm like we are talking about this when we um i don't know if we brought i think we brought it up in the avengers gameplay a bit where i'm like i want to see prowler like i was so excited when he was in there and i feel like most of what happened in homecoming like michael mando from better call saw ah we don't care about scorpion childish gambino ah we don't care about the prowler we're doing what (laughs) we're doing other things um (laughs) but yeah he's just i saw him live and he was incredible live. And, you know, like the This Is America video was another example of just him coming together and and just doing so many great things. And then, yeah, there's some episodes of Atlanta that I'm just like, I'm so jealous of you, dude. I'm like so envious. And then I think the one thing I just thought of this, the one thing that I think of when it comes to movies is a movie that I was not even excited for. And I was only excited for because he was playing Lando, which was the solo movie, yeah. which I give Alden, what, uh, Eckridge, however you say his last name. Alden all right. <laughs> all right. Thank you. I give him all the props because I actually thought he was pretty good. Like I was really shocked how good he was. And this is my review of, uh, solo Star Wars story. I'm just kidding. No, it's not. Um, but like, yeah, like literally he was just doing his, Billy D. Williams. And that was the one reason why I was like, well, I'm at, oh, hi, Maylene. Um, she's like, me too. I love Lando. Lando's my favorite character. I can't wait for the Disney Plus show. If that even happens. Um, but yeah, he's just one of those people where like you, it's just, it's annoying. But like the thing, unlike Gerard Way, which I think Gerard Way doesn't stress me out because with him they were done with mcr he was doing his own music but he did his own like he was doing comics and stuff so you kind of could know okay you're focused on this and like i don't have to worry i've been waiting four years for stop maylene i've been waiting four years for a follow-up season to atlanta because he does all this shit and then covid happened but like that's my issue with him that's my issue with him is like he does too much over the course of time so it's like with Gerard it's like now they're coming back and doing MCR and I think it's I think now they understand like maybe they're gonna do more than this one album and tour maybe not I don't care if they don't like if this is it if they're like we have one final album we want to do and we want this tour I'm cool with that because I feel like it's kind of like Spider-Man 3 Like, I feel like MCR ended and we were kind of like, well, that sucks. Like, I feel like we needed at least one more album. So if this is the end, I'll be okay. But um, no, man, Donald Glover, talented son of a bitch. I'm envious of him. But yeah, he is for sure talented. And he's not up there for me because I don't have as much of a personal attachment as you do, Mm -hmm. even though I'm the only one. (laughs) between the two of us that's actually watched community (laughs) i've watched i really don't know if it was an ex of mine that liked the show but i feel like i remember watching like a good amount of like the first season first season's not like amazing but yeah um it is probably well season one and two are the longest because season three they cut the budget on it and then they weren't even sure if they were coming back. And then season four, they cut more of the budget on it and fired the, the creator of the show, Dan Harmon, oh, because yeah. they didn't like Dan's working style. And then, Oh, and then season, remember they did a new season on Yahoo. Yeah. Season six was on Yahoo, which, cl- which ended up canceling Yahoo streaming service. <laughs> yahoo just so y'all y'all youngins you hear about disney plus yahoo had a streaming service for a hot minute mm-hmm. uh, but that, that. Se- that season is on netflix so if you are on netflix you can watch all six seasons and you know maybe one day they'll get that movie and maybe donald glover will come back for it because he left during season five 
and it was sad. I mean, when they did the reading, like I know during COVID, a lot of people did like the the script readings and stuff. He seemed to be like, oh no, he's I, yeah, he's so cool with them. Yeah, it's like not, he, and, and, yeah, and it's again, it it was more like they understand they they clearly know what his passions are and what he wants yeah. to do, which you can tell a lot about a lot of people when they're not mad at you about anything. They're just like, here you go. Yeah. Just do it. Like, we yeah, understand. Cause he, I think, yeah. Cause even I remember they, <laughs> when, because the internet came out and he was putting out a lot of these notes and people thought he was suicidal and he's like, no, I'm just, I'm just airing out all my things. And that was the one thing he talked about. He's like, there was really no issue. It was just, it was time. And clearly, like he said, he moved on from it. But like seeing him back in that panel, he clearly was like, but it was funny because they all seemed like he was like the cool kid. Like he was the big rock star. And they're like, oh my God, Donald's back. And he was just like, okay. <laughs> well, no, he, he commented that, hey, like we should start like a group chat or something. And they're like, oh. Oh, we well, do. We, we have one. And he's like, what? And they're like, we just thought you were too busy to chat with us. He's like, no, <laughs> because they're just like, they understand that he's just yeah. got a crazy life now. And yeah. I mean, for however he's able to handle it and, you know, being a fucking dad too, because that's insane. Yeah, that's true. And he's halfway to an EGOT. He needs to do something on Broadway and he needs to win an Oscar. He already got his Emmy and his Grammy. So he's halfway there. <laughs> I mean, I'm sure he could release a song, but you know, not for Lion King 2019. Yeah, that's going to be... Now, w- if we want to talk about people getting paychecks, let's talk about Barry Jenkins doing the sequel, which might not be a sequel to the John Favreau one, but it's a... He, Barry's like, you know what, Disney? Give me $6 million so I can go fund my next Moonlight, my next Beale Street, okay? Thank you so much. <laughs> but yes, Donald Glover... I felt like that was a good kind of parallel because I feel like a lot of my inspirations are kind of like Gerard and Donald where they're very like, you know, you know them for different things, but like it's the people you talk to. It's like, you know, like, oh, I know him from community. You know those kind of people. And then you go, oh, it's Childish Gambino. And then you know those kind of people. So, but yes, Mr. Glover, not Danny Glover's son, but he likes to act like he is. He says this multiple times. He's like, if he's, he's like, if people say I'm Danny Glover's son, I go, yeah, of course. Yeah, of course. Why not? He probably, he, he's going to get a picture with Danny Glover one day and be like, it's me and dad. If he doesn't have one already. Yes. So, okay. Um, I'm only going to cut you off now because we were running into issues because of course, Zoom wants to change like right as we're trying to do more videos so we're going to take a quick why break. is this now become an issue because i think they took it away from because the issue was you could do it if it was just two people you could do unlimited time but now you have to have a pro account to do this sort of thing so we're going to be the right t- back <laughs> pandemic and- times really be changing well yeah because now people don't need zoom so they're like but then why would they you would want people to We'll be right back. <laughs> I should have gotten more water during the break, but um, maybe die I'll of thirst, maybe, I guess. Maybe, maybe, that's 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 interesting. You say dying of thirst because oh, see, I should have transitioned into mine, but we're not going to do it. Y'all know who I'm talking about. Look, look, look. shut up with your weird ass sound effects who's your second person my second okay uh this will be an interesting one but more because i i'm more inspired by the fact that this man just has such passion for what he does and never takes a goddamn break from what he's doing and i doubt he's taking a break right now from all his productions um He is a man named Masahiro Sakurai. Now, Brian, do you know who that is? I was about to say the guy who's like the mainstream anime movie guy, but I know that's not him. 
That's not like that Howl's it? Moving Castle and stuff. No, that's that's uh, Miyazaki. That's okay. That I was gonna say. I'm like, it has a name that I can remember. I'll be honest. Is this is this a Nintendo guy? It is kind of a Nintendo guy. He 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 gave birth to a nice big little pink puffball named Kirby. He's Kirby's dad. Where did that where did that come out of? His ass? Uh, I mean, knowing how Kirby works, how he's just a like entitled vacuum inside his stomach. Uh he probably had to pull him from a black hole or something. He probably just <laughs> fucked the black hole. Anywho. So not only is he the creator of Kirby, he's the main director and producer of the Smash Brothers series. Mm. Now, this man has been working on Smash Brothers since since the mid-90s. Came out with the first one on the 64 in 99. And then immediately had to pump out a new one two years later for the GameCube. <laughs> and then he took a small break and then had to pump out another Smash for the Wii because Nintendo said, we're putting a Smash Brothers in the Wii. And he said, we are <laughs> and then immediately after the we was all done they're like we need something for the wii u and they're also like uh how about the 3ds as well and he came out with that one and as soon as that production he jumped into the latest one ultimate and it's just the fact that even though he, you you can see in interviews that like he's just a calm, collected dude that just loves video games and all that passion about it. You know, he's a crazy man too for the fact that he just doesn't ever take a break. Like, and that's a, I mean, that's a lot of Japanese like video game and anime type of people is just they don't stop. They keep working mm -hmm. because what else are they going to do with their lives? Have a kid, get married. No, the Japanese don't run like that. Um, but he's just got such passion for video games as a whole. Because, I mean, as early as, you know, when he was making the original Smash Brothers, you know, that was a collection of all these Nintendo characters coming together. And from the way that their move styles work, you can just tell that he just was like, there's a reason this character's in the game. There's a reason why this one. Here's a vault selection about looking through about different characters. So really quick, I want to interject this because this is actually a fascinating pick. Like, I'm very like, wow. Okay, so is so I would assume, is Super Smash, like, top five games of all time? Top ten? It's it's up there. Okay. Because uh, I, I own all of them in my living room. I have from 64 to the current. I have all of them. So, it's clearly telling you something that I, I like the dude's work. And, yeah. and, I mean, of course, again, Kirby, you know, being his star child, I see what you did there. Um, he, he, I mean, he made Kirby for God's sake. So how can you be mad at Kirby? Kirby's <laughs> the most mad at for Kirby. <laughs> he's just sucking up whatever he wants. He in the new game, he's mouthful. -mo. He didn't help out with this new game, but he's mouthful. No, he's a car now. <laughs> <laughs> um, again, it's just this. This man has. I don't wouldn't say an encyclopedic knowledge of like all these histories and stuff, but he just. He cares about this industry so much. And even though he's like pressured to do these projects, he doesn't hate doing it, as I can tell. He, for a period of time, when the last one came out, he would, he would post about all this production stuff all the time, talking about how it's going and posting pictures daily about different things, trying to either like trying to announce something new or something that he just liked about in the game. And then when it comes to like when they was adding in all these like specialty characters into Smash, I mean, starting off with in Brawl with freaking Solid Snake of all people, Solid Snake, that was a big deal at the time. It was. And he was just like, Metal Gear's Metal Gear's awesome, and he was good friends with Kojima, which I'm not the biggest like Kojima dude, but that dude's also insane as well. Well, yeah, and his story is insane too. I think I. I'm not more inspired by him. I'm more inspired about how he's able, how his story is able to be like, he was working for a, a shitty company and they screwed him over and he was still able to prevail. Yeah. That story is awesome. 
Um, but anyway, back to Sakurai, you know, you know, he's just able to build these connections and then he was able to put Sonic in the game, which, you know, building that connection with Sega. And then when he put out the next one, it was Mega Man, which he's my main. So thank you, Sakurai. And then putting in the, I think the biggest deal at the time was when he would put in Cloud from Final Fantasy VII because, you know, that was a that was a big deal originally back in the '90s when you know Final Fantasy was a Nintendo thing for the longest time, and then Nintendo was putting out inferior products, so Square jumped ship and put to the PlayStation, and this is the first time we've really seen Cloud on a Nintendo console. And that was because Sakurai was able to make connections and talk to Square and be cool with that. He's just a and nice now, guy. That's how they he, get all this. <laughs> he, he genuinely is. It, it, people actually can, because then like you go into Ultimate and you got some of these characters. You're like, oh, wow, cool. And then they announced the first DLC character, Joker from Persona 5. And no, everyone's like, excuse me, what? And this is when Sakurai's like, yeah, I'm a big fucking nerd. I like Persona games. I play on PlayStation. What are you going to do? Fight me, Nintendo? You, I work for you, but you're going to fire me? No, you can't. But it, it wasn't even just that. It was just more of the fact that he's like, I understand what people want. And like, there's little things. And Joker wasn't like on many people's licks, but like, it was just like the biggest shock that he's like, he was able to do this. Yeah. And, and then he was able to get Banjo-Kazooie in the fucking game. You know, the again, a thing where Nintendo fucked over and lost Rare to Microsoft for better or for worse. Yeah. Make that argument. But he was able to just have a good communication with Microsoft. And there you go. And everyone was so happy. Even though he's not really great in the game, everyone was so happy he's in the game. Is that, and, is that, a, is that a meta commentary about Microsoft owning Rare? No, no. It's just Banjo's not that great in Smash. <laughs> and then... Good. Uh, after, afterwards i was trying to think of the next like i mean yeah we had um a couple nintendo reps in there too whatever but the, and then he ended it off oh no he got sephiroth from final fantasy 7 that was a big fucking deal because he got the big bad because when ultimate came out there was a lot of confusion with what was going on with cloud there was there was talks about how potentially he wasn't able to get back in the game but again because of his good graces he was able to get Cloud back in because they wanted every fighter back for this one. And he only came with two songs. And we're like, huh, that's weird. Because there was a lot more on, on for four. And then they were able to put Sephiroth in the game and then all this stuff came through and they were just celebrating. They are just like, we love Final Fantasy. We love these characters. We love talking about it. And Sephiroth's awesome. He's got a big long sword and he'll kill your girlfriend without any question mm -hmm. and then he put the dude from tekken in it and i'm not a big tekken guy but he was like hey tekken oh i forgot he put in fucking street fighter too so you can put street fighter characters in the wear as well he's just like i'm tank he's like i'm pulling from all these people all the and even though there's like no fighters there are <laughs> there are me costumes from bethesda games because bethesda's chill with all this shit too the last me fighter outfit was the doom slayer because they were never going to be able to put him in in the actual game but they were able to put a skin of him at least and people appreciated that he he put sands from undertale for god's sakes he understood he understood what type of like people and how how to get these people excited for this type of stuff and he put cuphead in there that was like oh we love cuphead he's so cool he's got a great netflix show <laughs> uh and then finally i mean he ends because i i i don't know if he's retiring after this game or not i'm assuming not because this man just won't stop he might be done with smash brothers though is the thing but when he announced when they announced that sora was the final character it was kind of just like this makes sense to end it here and like he can breathe you know and he's like ah, i'm so glad we got to finish this project it you know he'd been working on it since 2016 you know before yeah. the switch was out you know because he was finishing up all the dlc for the last match and just the fact that he's able to work hard stay determined still have a love and passion for video games because that's the only way he was able to put some of these characters in was you know playing these not obscure games but playing these games that people like love like 
would you think that this Japanese man who works all day would have time to play a game like Undertale? Like that yeah. game takes time and effort to understand and things like that to be able to like pull in the Doom Slayer for a co- again, these are just costumes, but you know, he ha- understand this man plays Doom for God's sakes. <laughs> that's that's metal and this man this japanese man who's busy all the time is just playing doom it's insane it's just again the fact that he has such a passion for games such a passion to work hard and make quality product and also live up for fan expectations because there's a lot of there's been a couple times in the dlcs that you know fans weren't happy with a character choice or something but he he was still happy and you know excited to put these characters in he clearly because everything had to pass by him he had to be like yeah i approve of this character being in and he's got to have a good reason because every time that a character was announced he did a whole demonstration about the character and he clearly had a passion talking about them so just the again the fact that he's able to do all this stuff and still have the passion for video games and things like that. It's like, yeah, you know, that inspires me, you know, that keep my love to keep discovering weird stuff, the weird games and to, you know, talk about games and things like that. Cause you know, there's people that genuinely do care about games and there's an audience to listen for it. Yeah. You know, it's really funny that I don't think it's going to work for the third one, but my second person kind of fits in some of those pieces where you know you were talking about a guy who like really respects the industry he's in he's very well respected you kind of get surprised when he plays certain things that you're like what like you of all the people? he when when covid was going around um he was still releasing characters oh i forgot steve from minecraft was a thing he put he was able to put minecraft in the game um but um well, during the COVID times he was at home and he showed off his whole deck and he has so many consoles <laughs> and I'm like I'm like where do you have time to play all these because he had like he had a PS he had a PS4 Pro well, this was before the PS5 came out mm-hmm. um yeah he had like a PS4 Pro he had a, like Xbox One there clearly and things like that it's like when Phil Spencer when he randomly like posts videos and he has a switch in the background you're like I, again Phil Spencer is someone that I respect I don't I think he inspires me, but like I respect him for so yeah. much for how he was able to fix Xbox. <laughs> Pretty much. Um, but again, it's just the fact that like you could just do that because who cares? It's it's just video games. I mean, Nintendo cares because as long as you're playing it on their systems and not illegally downloading it, you know. But you know, yeah. how about you just re-release the games? This is why Nintendo is not a full inspiration because they do shitty shit. <laughs> um but no, he's, again, he just has this passion. And, you know, I'm assuming your guy has passion. Do British people have passion? Because you said Japanese, uh, he was, you know, Japanese. Do British people have passion? I don't know. Uh, they have different types of passions. I mean, because we, to fight the British, we just threw tea into the ocean. So. They were pretty mad. I mean, Americans get mad over everything. As you hey, know. you know, Americans love spilling the tea, so. And Americans love Christopher Nolan. They do. I think more than the British. Uh, you think so? I mean, when he, when he fucking did Dunkirk, Britain was like, oh my gosh, you're, you're a Brit boy. Um, you're a Brit boy. I mean, this is not a surprise to Eric. Eric knows that he's like my favorite director. And we, we actually have a couple person. Well, I guess just one oh yeah because you never you never came to the midnight shows of uh the two batman movies with me i know we went no to, we saw interstellar and in, um at the henry ford when it was still like a film projector yeah and i remember after the movie you and i literally walked they let us go behind and you and i took pictures of it and then years later they got rid of it and it's now digital he'd be so mad he would be yeah but yeah christopher nolan i think is I mean, he's the reason why I want to make movies and he inspires me in a lot of ways of like his movies aren't like my favorite. Like I think as I started, when you have a certain group of people that you love, those are your favorite things. But then the more you extend your palette, you start to learn, oh, you know what? Maybe Dunkirk isn't the best movie of the year. 
I still love that movie, but maybe it's not the best. Maybe, um, what else? Oh, maybe Tenet wasn't the greatest movie of all time, but it's okay because his movies are kind of like he, I'd say him and Quentin Tarantino are kind of like the last two more modern directors where like their movies are the equivalent of going to see like a Marvel movie. Like it's like, oh, the Nolan movie, the Tarantino movie. Like there's, obviously you have OGs. Well, yeah, you got nobody saw, work. well, nobody, well, nobody saw West Side Story. So that doesn't, <laughs> But that, well, there's probably other reasons why, you know, a movie that didn't need to be remade for whatever reason. Um, but I haven't watched it, it's fine, it's good. I have no insult. Hey, check my letterbox, I gave it a good review, so you can go check that out. Um, but yeah, Nolan's just one of those guys where I remember very vividly my mom forced my sister to take me in her because she, she was going with her friends to see The Dark Knight. She forced her to take me because it was like two days before my birthday. And all of them, I remember, were probably like, you know, these young high schoolers like, oh, that was a good movie. And I just remember sitting there being like, my I mind think, is my, I think, my, my brain. I think I like it's the equivalent of like it's it's that whole ratatouille moment of like just that moment where you're like and now obviously I'd have that moment now where like you go back in time and you remember that love. That was that moment where I said, I think I understand what filmmaking is. Because when you're young, you don't understand all the things put into a movie. You see the people and you see how cool it looks or whatever. And he was, that was the movie where I finally sat back and went, I, I want to know about film. And so he's sort of always driven me to that and yeah like it's funny when I hear him do interviews and like he was at Sundance one year and someone was talking about cinematography and he name dropped Fruitvale Station like Christopher Nolan went to go he saw Fruitvale Station like that's just so weird to me like I was just like what like that's a phenomenal movie I love that movie but like Christopher like imagine Christopher and then when COVID restrictions opened up more he went pictures were taken of him going to see Judas and the Black Messiah like it's just so funny to me <laughs> like he and then like he's also that guy like if I hear him cuss it's really weird too like I'm like you're not supposed to cuss you're yeah him Nolan. Miranda Cosgrove I get that reference I do get that reference maybe um Christopher Nolan's next movie should be a movie adaptation of iCarly we get the rights from a uh, fucking foot fetish. Oh, actually, and that, I, and that was what? weird because then I brought up Quentin Tarantino earlier. <laughs> Reference well, points. I mean, I think at least he's trying with legal adults. That's all that matters. That's a good point. That's a fair point. Um, I mean, the number one thing I love about Christopher Nolan is his love of film and like his preservation of film. And I think the main thing that I love about him is his willingness to do things in camera he's very big on like practical this man can literally walk into a building go i want you <clears throat> to I restore want <clears throat> i want you to go restore hundreds of world war ii planes ships how much would that cost chris uh about 300 million dollars okay. okay whatever like he's like the last guy that could do that. And it's like, like even with Tenet, like Tenet was a more original movie and they're like, hey, so what do you need money for? Uh, so I'm going to have my guy get into a, a airplane and he's just going to crash into an airport hangar. How much is that going to cost? Probably about a hundred million. Okay, whatever, <laughs> whatever. Now let's see if anything crazy happens like that in Oppenheimer. Oppenheimer Probably not. One, one year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's going to go up against uh, Barbie. That's the other meme on the how, how funny, you know, because he's not working for Warner Brothers anymore. Oh, yeah, yeah, because he that movie's going to be under Universal. He, yeah, yeah, Warner Brothers. I mean, you know, you could say what you want about Christopher Nolan and the whole thing of being safe, but there's a reason why Warner Brothers went and got sold by Discovery. When they made that decision to do day and date film releases. Um, 
but yeah, Christopher Nolan's just that guy. I I never think all of his movies are the best movie I've seen in my life, but I, I think there's no, and I know over time, you and I have kind of regressed on Interstellar, for example, because that was at a time where I was still like, Nolan, and I remember when that movie was over and we did a review on my solo channel long ago, I sounded, I feel like you and I sounded very like, but it's Christopher Nolan, so it's good. Like, it's cool. I, I know I, you, I know you hate it. I don't think it's garbage or anything. I, do I don't think- hate it. I just don't think that like, it's like a good time at all. I, I compare Interstellar with The Dark Knight Rises, but the difference is The Dark Knight Rises is a hot mess, has plot holes, but it ends and it's satisfying and you're like, okay, it's a hot mess, whatever. Interstellar is ambitious, is a hot mess, has plot holes, and then it ends. And you're like, what, that- what the fuck was that? Like, literally, they are the same movie, but Dark Knight Rises, you can at least go, you know what? It was still pretty cool. Like, let's not lie. It was pretty fucking cool. Interstellar, you're just like... What's huh? Matt Damon doing here? <laughs> I was, I knew he was going to be in the movie, but yeah, he shows up. I remember my dad said, oh, the moment I saw Matt Damon show up, I said, oh, he's a bad guy. Which is, and it's so upsetting because low-key in that reconnaissance, I think that's one of the best performances out of all those movies he did. Like, that was probably one of the top Matthew McConaughey performances in that era and it's so upsetting because he was so good and there's a lot of stuff in that movie that doesn't work like he his stuff is fine it's the his daughter and like how Timothy Chalamet turned Casey Affleck like they gave him nothing to do but again I I I go into a Christopher Nolan movie not expecting anything. And whether you like his movies or you don't like his movies, you have to appreciate that no matter what, you're going to go into his movies and go, what am I about to witness? Like what and what crazy shit am I about to see? So he needs to get Tom Cruise in a movie. Like that's the ultimate goal. Cause then Chris is gonna, cause then it's just gonna be a fucking jerk off as he's gonna go, so uh uh bloody hell. I'm going to crash an airplane and I'm going to drive it because I'm Tom Cruise. I'm going to drive the airplane. And then Chris is like, very good. And he's like, let's make a fucking movie, man. What the fuck? He didn't show up in Doctor Strange too. I wasn't surprised. Spoiler alert. Yeah, I don't know when you're releasing this, but uh, spoiler alert. When I'm releasing this, I'm going back in time and releasing this the day Doctor Strange 2 came out. (laughs) I know. Yeah, I'm putting it out before Doctor Strange 2 comes out. But yeah, Christopher Nolan, my British father, and then his brother who made a really good season of Westworld, and then he kind of fell apart. So, anywho, he's doing a Fallout show for Amazon. Oh. So we'll see how that works out. Amazon. I say Amazon, but like, you know, Amazon actually does put up pretty good shows. Yeah, they got the boys, and they, they had transparent. They had transparent before uh, a I hear, guy did got canceled. I hear uh, <laughs> uh, Mrs. Maisel is pretty good too. Oh yeah, that too. But okay, sir, we're down to our final uh, two. Hopefully, we can. Zoom doesn't fuck us over. So, who is your final inspiration? Because I'm not gonna lie, your second one threw me the fuck off. So I'm ready for you to come in. And I'm going to be shocked at this one. <laughs> uh, my third inspiration, again, probably will throw you off. Might throw you off. I don't know. Um, he is an Australian boy, mate. Uh, and he is mainly known for writing comics, as in pretty much he writes comics. He's a man named Tom Taylor. You have no idea who. Well, that is. that's not really film because I expected you to say something comic book related, but then you open with Gerard Way, so I was like, "Oh, is this like your comic book guy?" But you can kind of get away with it because he does other stuff. <laughs> but okay, I don't know. Tell me some stuff that he's done. Like, what is like his main? So he works 
well he he's done stuff for marvel as well um but he's main he's currently running at dc okay. he is writing um he's, he's wrote many of things he wrote uh the injustice uh tie-in comics okay so they were prequel comics about you know before the first game about how this evil superman came to power and that was my introduction to him and dude they those those should not have been as good as they were because you know it's a video game tie-in comic book and it just it, it made sense he wrote the characters out very well uh how he was able to conform this superman into this evil being how he was able to show off um all these different characters living in this early regime then how he show, how he showed off a brutal death in nightwing with i i don't know if you uh know anything about the prequel for injustice or whatever because there's the animated thing that they tied it from but it's not really that good i haven't watched it but um there's an assault on Arkham and uh, Damien and Bruce are getting in a fight and Nightwing's trying to break it off because, you know, he's got good tensions between the both of them and Damien's leaning more towards Superman because, oh boy, Damien doesn't like his dad. <laughs> uh, Daddy issues. He, he does. Um, and he's like, oh, whatever. And he throws one of Nightwing's baton sticks and he, it hits him like on the side of the head, kind of just like slightly knocks him out. He lands on the ground and breaks his leg on some rubble. And Bruce just screams and he's crying and he's so upset. And he literally yells at Damien that you killed my son. And it's just like, this is so intense right now. It's so heartbreaking because you can tell that this shouldn't have happened. And here we are. And then he showed off the death of like Green Arrow when he got murdered. And it's this first person angle. Where Superman's just beating the living crap out of him. Well, beating him to death, literally. And he's just dialoguing about his love towards Black Canary. And it's just like the saddest thing ever. Because <laughs> he's just getting wrecked. And he's just professing his love. And you're like, damn. Um, so he did that. And then he's done a couple of other things. Uh mainly he did the dc series pretty recently i i see i see funkos for it so i yep. I've, I've seen he's images. the he's the writer of that he's the main writer of that there's okay. like one or two spin-off series i think but he wrote that and that was very interesting to see where those characters went um because you know here's the zombie apocalypse how do we explain it oh dark side uploaded the uh the anti-life equation into cyborg and it turned people into zombies and it just it made sense for how it worked because it was he put it i guess he messed up cyborg enough that he was able to do it and cyborg wasn't able to do anything about it because his freaking jaw was ripped off did you you want to know a fun fact so um so Zack Snyder he you know he did his um justice league movie his and four, um, four hour one yeah his four hour one um and you know, Warner Brothers is like, okay, asshole, leave us alone. And then he's like, no, I'm going to adapt Deceased because that's the sequel. But then they're like, we're going to sue you. So then he just made um, Army of the Dead. Dead. Okay, Batista. Yeah, and now he's doing it. It's a fun fact. Way. Um, It's fake, but it's actually real. So R Restore the Snyder versus some people would say. Uh, some people would say, not me. I, I, mean, think, I think it's time to move on. I say, I say, Justice League two. I don't, I don't need more. But I personally <laughs> like the Justice League Snyder one. But you know, oh no, I did too. It's just that it was, you know, poor Ben Affleck. Anyways, um, so he wrote that. He also wrote uh, over at Marvel. He did a series called Dark Ages, which basically imagine that there was this chaotic being in the center of the earth and Dr. Strange went to go deal with it. But as he was like casting a spell to take care of it, you know, Dr. Strange died. So the spell kept going and it caused it, uh, a 
a, pretty much a cataclysmic event where it shut off all electricity. So it sent them back to the dark ages. Jamie Foxx was evil smiling when that happened. <sighs> uh, he's also, he's done some Batman runs too. Uh, let me see if I can pull up a quick discography, I guess. Discography. Yeah. Discography? Does he doesn't make fucking music? <laughs> the hell? Uh, I guess bookography. Um, bookography. <laughs> um, I know there's a term for that. Bibliography. I think that's what that is. Um. So, some more fun facts about him before I get more into it, like he was what he was written. Um. You know, I said he was from freaking uh over. He's, he's from Australia. Mm-hmm. He's also a high school dropout. So it tells you that, you know, as much as, you know, people say, you know, go up for higher education and stuff. He's this guy that literally dropped out of high school and is now a successful writer. Uh, he did a Suicide Squad run, you know, and, you know, Suicide Squad's all over the place, but it was a really good run. Um, but the main two books that I've been reading from him right now and it's a special place in my heart for one of them, as you'll hear in a second. The other one has been very controversial recently because of certain aspects and things. Um, the, the controversial one, he's been writing Superman, uh, the Son of Kal-El. So it's the main Superman book right now that he's writing about John Kent and the main controversy. Oh, because he's a gay boy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because he's gay. But you know what? He's, he's like... Why does it matter? No, love is love, as they say. He's a fucking alien. He's an like, alien. Chill out. <laughs> he doesn't care about gender. Um, but and I mean, they recently brought he brought it up to the fact to his mom. He was like, he's he's like, mom, I have something to talk to you about. And and Lois is like, come here. And they're like, oh. And then mom was like, I love you for the way that you are. And we're like. Oh, because Lois Lane, you wouldn't suspect it also might kind of be the type to be like, no, you need to follow like the rules of life. But no, she she's she's a cool mom. And then Batman was like, you can't trust your boyfriend right now. <laughs> of course, John's like a teenager, almost an adult, and is like, nah, man. Um, but no, the main the main book that I'm reading from him. And of course, special thing is he's writing my boy. He's writing my boy Nightwing. Um, he's been writing him since for all, I would say over a year, a year and a half now. Um, and it's his best work. He just understands the character of Dick that well. Um, it's very interesting how he was brought in because he kind of had to bring him in after Dick's worst arc. Um, he got shot in the head and pretty much forgot all of his memories from when his parents died. As you do. And he went by Rick Grayson. But he, he had these mental things where he would just remember how to be Nightwing. And so would just not be Nightwing. He would just wear like black, <laughs> black paint or fight crime and be a taxi driver. And he dated this girl at a bar and then kind of uh, kind of fucked her over at the end of it because they were kind of like we need to get rid of this arc right now because people are hating it um but no he he came in he he uh alfred has recently died in the comics and he's still dead they almost someone almost brought him back we thought he was going to come back but no he was like no i can't do that which is fine because i'm actually kind of glad since you know we need stakes in these types of things we need these prominent characters to be like yeah they're not coming back let's 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 do it um but alfred gave dick all of his money that he had from working from the wains because alfred lived for free he got free food bruce wasn't eating that food so who else was alfred of course but he had all this he just gave him all this money so Dick is trying to be a better person, help the community of Bloodhaven. Now people are after his fucking back, as in the bad guys, as in Blockbuster, not 
the company, the bad guy. <laughs> um, but it's just the fact that, again, and, and I can go on and on about everything he's done. It's just the fact that, you know, he's this, he's this younger writer who's understood the industry and is respected for the way that he writes. He's got a very, not witty, but he's just like, he, he gets in these emotional beats as in like the injustice stuff where like, you know, Dick died and, and Green Arrow died, but then he understands these characters, hum, humorous beats. There was recently a tie in between himself. He did a thing with Superman and Nightwing. And there's this dude, this bad guy who's trying to beat up on Superman and John grabs him and the dude headbutts him. And Dick just goes, you would actually headbutt Superman. <laughs> Because you, you, they have like the, the, the panel where it's like it hurts. He's like, you would actually do that? <laughs> so he just understands these characters. And I, it sucks that, you know, he has this contract with only DC because I would like him to do more Marvel stuff mm-hmm. to see what like type of stuff he would do. Because um, I think he's a, he would be a very good, um, he'd be a very good Spider-Man writer. He'd be a very good um like in the spider-man verse he could be very good at that i think he'd be very good with younger characters like that um because there's other people in the industry that like not try to copy his style but just can't try to get that style that he has and it's it sticks out so much where there's like a couple projects that i'm not like into from him but like i'm like I, I and I'm just like I'm glad he's doing it. I'm glad he's able to do it. Um, he put out um, an independent like story based around like Peter Pan and stuff, and he was able to do that just because people respected him and were able mm-hmm. to, you know, he got that out. And I haven't read it, um, but I'm going to assume it's good. I haven't really read anything bad by him. I'm sure I can find something that's bad, you know, deep down. Um, Sorry, guys, about that random edit. Stupid shit with the Zoom happened, but you were talking about, you were kind of doing like your conclusion, I think. Conclusion, yeah. yeah. Again, it's this guy who dropped out of high school um, and just continued showing his love and passion for comic books and things like that. And now has become my favorite current writer, I would say. Um, I would say probably my current favorite, but it's just the fact that he was able to do all this stuff is mm-hmm. as much as like, <laughs> there's a couple other writers. There's not one that's exactly like him at Marvel, but he it doesn't. And it's because it's not a familiar story, but it's just for the fact that, you know, he went to school and things like that for writing in comics. And then he got an internship at Marvel and they were going to offer him a job and he denied it because he was like, I want to get back in when I'm, fully writing again uh this is donny cates by the way and he did that and then he did his own thing for a couple of years and was hired on to work at marvel and did a successful venom run which turned into king and black which a lot of people want in the future um but he's like the similar version i would say to tom whereas tom there's actual things you know for as much as the injustice 2 animated movie isn't really that great. That's adapted from his work. There's actual things pulled from him that the fact that they're just like starting to pull things out and, you know, DC says pops, things like that, individual things. Again, John Kent is super huge right now. He didn't make John Kent up, but, you know, he kind of, you know, made the staple for John right now as being the symbol of, you know, not only being the symbol of like Superman, but also like, hey, like your biggest hero can also be gay and that's cool. And yeah, I just, I just think he's uber talented at what he does. And again, he hasn't done anything that I don't like. I'm sure I'll find something one day though, but you know, it's okay. We all have our flaws and he's, he's very open about his stuff on Twitter too. He's very open about his writing process and supporting his artists as well. You opened your mouth. I opened my mouth because up until that point, 
I was like, okay, I'm just going to bring up my third person. But the way you ended it, I think you know exactly who I'm going to say now, just because of what you said about how not everyone's perfect. We get it. You didn't like the Kendrick Lamar album that much. If you are watching this when it comes out and you hear me say that, and the first thing you think is, uh, I'm going to find you and kill you. I'm doing a rank them on my solo channel with my boy, Joshua Kirk. So you'll probably get a mini review about that there, but I'm still early in it. But yes, Kendrick, Lamar, K-Dot, Cornrow Kenny, Kung Fu Kenny, Kenny Lama. You know the names. It's Kendrick Lamar. They played the, the, the one song from Black Panther he did in the break room today. I was like, oh yeah, he did do that song. <laughs> that was... That was something that when I heard that was going to happen, I was like, this is going to be so cool. But then I forgot it's a Marvel movie. And then I, not because I wanted him to be like cussing or anything. It was more of like, I mean, in that song, he does say a couple cuss words. They censor them out. But um, I was very like, I was like, Kendrick, I thought you were going to like pull through, but you made kind of like a poppy rap album. Um, this is the best part on that song. And then, and then you're like, oh, I can't. Well, he got nominated for an Oscar. I can't wait for him to perform. And he's like, I'm not showing up. I ain't doing that. <laughs> I'm not doing that. I'm too tired for this. He's, I'm too tired for this. Yeah, Kendrick Lamar is someone that I've loved. Now we're going back, like you and I talk about, like when we were this, when we were this. I remember it was going into my senior year of high school. Jesus. That was almost uh. 10 years ago. Yeah. Well, I actually know that would be 10 years ago going into 10 years. Yeah. Cause his, cause good kid, mad city came out October, 2012. And I was listening to him probably around this time. Cause I remember I didn't end up listening to section 80 before that, but I remember around this time was when um, I was listening to him because I was hearing like, that was kind of around the time where, you know, we were kind of in that internet era of, oh, I know this artist. I'm so cool. I know an independent <laughs> artist. I think this artist is going to blow up. Um, and there was like someone like him and then there's someone like Macklemore and clearly, you know, Macklemore did not last because Macklemore. Um, but, but Kendrick Lamar lasted and he's just a guy that um, I went with him over like Andre 3000. Andre 3000, I think, inspires me a lot more because of just how diverse he is in the way that he dressed. Like for someone like him to come and rap and to wear the clothes he wore and to carry himself the way he does and just, you know. And then he gave us obviously a dope Cartoon Network show. No, I was <laughs> literally about to say that. He came through with the dope show. Yeah. That that shit is underrated. That's underrated Cartoon Network era. Like around that time when that show was on. Yes. It did last two or three seasons. I can't remember. Um, but I went with Kendrick. I think it was just easier and it was more relevant and it was more of a talking point. Um yeah, I mean to pimp a butterfly is one of my favorite albums of all time. He's just one of those guys where I just love the way, like I just love what he talks about. And the way he carries himself. And, you know, when I saw this, the heart, when I saw the new heart part five and just watching what he was doing and also being very creeped out at how well the deep fakes were in the video. And the whole time I'm watching this, I'm looking in the credits and I'm like, why did he think the creators of South Park? What the fuck's going on? Because that's their company. Because they did something with Donald Trump. And I was like, oh, okay. So that makes sense. But just... And then I remember seeing him on like the Grammys and just the way he thinks is just so incredible. And I know, I know I was really big on him and I remember I made you listen to him and you really liked him. And I probably, I bet you, you haven't really listened to him since high school, which is a nope. shame because his follow-up album, the year you left to start going to Florida was to pimp a butterfly. And that is probably his best album. That album is fucking incredible. And I mean, you probably heard songs. You probably heard like humble, right? Sit down. Hold up, bitch. Mm. Be humble. Hold up, little bitch. Hold up, little <laughs> bitch. That's what Montez said in the vlog. <laughs> but no, like what you were saying just about 
you know, the creativity that he has and just the way he charted his own path and the confidence he has and just the way he, you know, respects the medium, but just does his own thing and just is very passionate about it. And the people that are, you know, he is the first rap artist to win a Pulitzer Prize. Like when you look at these old American establishments, people are like, a rap artist? they can't win one of these things me, 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 me. apparently it's a t-rex <laughs> politician <Rawr. laughs> but no he's just that guy where like just he just i'm so every time i hear him talk i'm just so inspired by him and i remember like i was so mad because i've been waiting for all these years and I was so happy that he finally put out an album. But I remember when he got announced to be at the Super Bowl halftime show. And I was like, oh! and then he just did an older song. But he was the best part of the whole halftime performance. I was like, look at him. And then he just kind of snuck away for a little bit of time. Um, but yeah, he he's kind of taken over in that regard. Um, in terms of current, it was probably Andre. And then it went to uh, Kanye. And now it's Kendrick for... Obvious, obvious reason. reasons jinx um but yeah i no man there's really not a lot to say about him that i think i will say if there's anything to encapsulate the thing about kendrick that i love so much is you know obviously and i was about to you know i'm gonna quote the movie because okay so we live in a society uh Thank you, Joaquin Phoenix. We live in a society, right? And, uh, you know, we have very tone deaf people and I'm not going to name names, but just think of someone who's in the military. They could be a captain and they can be a captain, not DC, maybe another comic book label, like captain, not DC, not Dark Horse, but captain something, I don't know, who makes comments about, you know, you can't be an old white man to enjoy movies not made for old white men. But also, I think Moonlight was the best movie of 2016, and I'm not gay nor black. So, like, Kendrick's just one of those guys where I remember hearing on To Pimp a Butterfly, there's a song called You. And I remember sitting, I was on Spotify the night of, I put my headphones on and I got to that song. And that song is one of the most depressing things. That is like the most accurate representation of like depression and like suicidal thoughts. And it was just that moment of like, when you have that realization of that connection to someone who is so different than you and grew up so different than you, but you have such an appreciation and love for what they're doing and what they're speaking out on. And especially that was a rough year like that in 2016 are probably two of the roughest years of my life, 2015, 2016. And to have that song and just, and some of the stuff he talks about on that album, but just the way, you know, and he's also one of those guys where I'm not religious, I'm agnostic, but when a person talks so much about God in such a passionate way, like him, like I really am like, fascinated and like i feel as interested in god and i love it's like in that moment i go i love god i love god i believe in god because you make me believe in god <laughs> um but yeah man damn that's his last album title see it would have been funny if you knew because then you could go ha 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 but you're like what who what? are you it's supposed to be funny but yeah, Kendrick Lamar. I feel like there's a lot of people. Like Tyler, the creator, inspires me. Oh, Tyler. Remember remember when we saw him in concert and that was at a time where people now that love his music would probably hate him because that's when he was just saying the gay slur and then he obviously came out as bi. A lot has happened since then. <laughs> yeah, he did the soundtrack for The Grinch. He did. He, he did. He definitely did that. I remember Brock Hampton had a song in the Grinch. Times are wild. Brock Hampton's for the children. Tyler, the creator's for the children. That's what I say. But yeah, man, those, that's my, that's my third inspiration. I have a lot of people, Bo Burnham, uh, Spike Jones, Olin Rogers, you know, there's a lot of people that inspire me. Uh, but I felt doing three, even though I just named three, four more. 
uh, was respectful, but we but we didn't deep dive into the other ones. Yeah. So yeah, we but, threw names out throughout it. Yeah. Yeah, but just remember, just remember when you think of our fucking videos we put together, just remember Kendrick Lamar made Brian put this video together. When you're listening to this, you just think, "Wow, Gerard Way had such a big impact that he's fucking making Brian play over." Or I was about to say Overwatch. Firewatch. Oh no, Gerard Way's not an Overwatch kind of guy. He does not seem like an Overwatch kind of guy. No, he's for sure um, a Firewatch kind of guy. Yeah. You know, people have Zodiac signs, and also people have video game signs. Gerard Way's a Firewatch. You know, we're gonna make a we're gonna make a list now. What type? Of- signs or the zodiac signs for games all of our inspiration as a video game a thread and then we just put like gerard way and then just the picture of firewatch (laughs) and we just go through kendrick lamar who's kendrick lamar look like he looks like this christopher nolan he looks like this what was um what's the guy the uh tom taylor right tom taylor tom taylor he's this game yep if any of you want to do that to our small fan base, um, you can do it and then waste your life. Thank you so much for watching podcast number four. We got introspective. We got deep. We talked. We, we dug got into our souls, you know? Um, yeah, like, comment, subscribe. Do the stupid shit. You know what? If you don't do any of that, best thing, if you like this video, just share it. Show your friends and your family. That's all I care about. We ain't, we, you know, we care about the, what's the algorithm. We no, care about no. the algorithm, but at the end of the day, if you share the video, that's the most important thing to me. Get the, you know, spread the word about the rascals. You yeah. know, the two rascals. Tell, tell your mom that the rascals appreciate her. Yep. In a, in a consensual way. In, in and yeah. not a dirty way. And uh, if mom's not around, um, Oh, we like dads. We like dads more than we do like dads. Yeah. That's why we were like, hey, moms, you know, just, you know, how you doing? Dads? Well, yeah. When we see dad walk out of the shower. I see this is when I sit and I get to wait and see if you're going to do the outro that you hate so much. It's grown. It's grown only a little bit. Tune alone. Oh, wow. He screamed it into the black hole that Kirby came from. Thank you. <laughs>